Right. JV? Yeah. I feel like we're on Mastermind, the specialist subject. Right. People don't often get this opportunity to uh, ask these questions, so uh, looking forward to this. We've obviously had a load of questions come in, so we will ask Ronnie and JV some questions try and get uh, some answers to things you've always wanted to know. Now, I've got to say, we've had so many questions in, but there is one question overriding in almost half of these bits of paper. And the first question is, Ronnie, are you taking part in this year's World Snooker Championships? Oh, what, uh, 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 can you hear me? They can hear you. They can hear you? Yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. There we go. So thank you, Ben. You were the first one who did that. And the championship will be all the better for having Ronnie in it, JV. Oh, listen, it's like any top sport. You need your, your top men. You know, golf, since Tiger Woods has disappeared, it drops down. You know, and we've been lucky over the years. We had Alex Higgins, Jimmy White, and then we were blessed with Ronnie. So of course we need him there. Of course we do. There we go. Exclusive in Lincoln. Okay, the next question from Jenna Bird. She's saying, Ronnie, yeah. what was your most memorable tournament win? Um, I've had a few, um, but I think probably... <laughs> um, a couple that stand out would probably be the 2012 World Championships. Yep. Yeah. That was a fantastic... Um, from start best, to... Best record I've ever seen, Ronnie. From, from, <laughs> <there you go. laughs> from start to finish, I think I just played as well as I could possibly play, and it, it never felt easy, but when I look back on it, I kind of really um, kind of just smashed through every opponent, which is a great feeling, you know? Um, I think the year after was great, where I took a year out. That was kind of a, that was a funny old one. You know, I had not planned for a year, and then obviously trying to come back and defend it against players that had been playing all year. So that was probably one of my biggest challenges, you know, to... I didn't think I'd even get past the first round, but each match I got into it, I started to started to lick, lick my lips a little bit more, and um, and then to finally win it was unbelievable. And I think the Masters in 2014 were, again, but like I said, there's so many tournaments where I just feel like it's been amazing, you know. So, um, but them two obviously stand out more than others. Okay, and JV, you've probably commentated on nearly all of Ronnie's 30 ranking event wins. For you, anything that stands out? Well, the one that when Ronnie had had a year out and uh, they unbelievably priced him eight to one to win the tournament. And he won his first round, he was having a bit of tip problems and I was outside amongst the TV vans having a cigarette. Ronnie's come out and said, can I sneak a fag off you? I said, how was the tip? He said, best I've ever had, get on. <laughs> so I rang on with mates and they all got on at six to one. I remember that year very well. <laughs> <laughs> I never had a bet, I'm not allowed. Okay, question from Joe Walsh from Bedfordshire. When did you first play left-handed? Um, I think I started when I was about 17. So, um, yeah, I was having a few problems with the right hand. I thought, I might as well, I've got a left hand here, so I might as well try this one. <laughs> and, um, and it felt all right, you know, so, you know, there's some shots I feel better left-handed, but really my right hand's the best. But, yeah, I started practicing for about a year, two years before I done it in front of the public because I didn't want to embarrass myself so I kind of sharpened up on it um, so at least when I did use it hopefully I'd, I had an idea of what was going on so and there was a little bit of controversy when you first played left-handed in the world championship when you played Elaine Robidoux mm. people made a lot out of that yeah um, but they make a lot out of everything so <laughs> yeah. yeah I don't have to do a lot for everyone to try and make a lot out of it so I'll get used to that it's just you know, you just learn to laugh at it. Do you remember that moment? I do remember that moment. You know, I think he was just jealous that he couldn't play as good as that right-handed. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, here's one from uh, table six. Uh, what do you think a 147 break should be worth? Um, I, th I think it should be just like it used to be, you know, like a standard prize, you know, uh, it used to be 20,000 or it was a car. I used to like getting a car because at least you could, uh, <laughs> you know, it felt like a special gift, you know, you'd give you the keys, you'd be like, oh, wow, it's, it was exciting, you know, like a, a little kid gets at Christmas when, he's, when he gets a toy. Um, so I think that was a nice gesture and obviously the World Championships was always, 
you know, the big prize of £147,000. So I always just think they were special moments in snooker. I don't know about you, John, but... Um, oh, absolutely. So, yeah. Apart from when Steve Davis made the first one, he got a scolder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but they are. They are special moments and they yeah. and they're things that people remember. A 147 in 5 minutes 20 seconds that Ronnie did wow. is one of the great memories in the game. So, to turn around at the end of that and say, well, he gets £5,000 for that is just for nonsense. You know, I'd rather have a gold medal or something or a clock, mm. you know, with 5 minutes 20 seconds on it or something. Yeah. And, when, and when you were playing, First of all, I think you're fair to say you, there wasn't as many 147s or no, kind no, of large no. Do you think that was obviously, we know the players were incredibly talented in that era. Mm. Was that down to equipment, the snooker balls? What, what do you think it was? Well, I always remember when they first put up a prize. It's a true story. And uh, we was all told, I think they put up a prize of £10,000 for a maximum, which is a lot of money because even the World Championship probably wasn't worth that then. And I always remember talking to Patsy Fagan, the Irish professional. I said, and we were talking about when do you think you'll come under pressure, you know, on this 147 break. And Patsy said, I think the best way out of it, when you pop the first red, go for the blue. <laughs> <laughs> OK, a question from Darren and Donna, who've travelled from Scotland. Who do you like playing against and who's the toughest player? Um, who do I like playing against? Um... I like playing, um, I think John Higgins is probably one of my biggest riv rivalries that I've had over the years. I used to love playing Stephen Hendry because he was just fearless and you'd have to, like, it's like a boxer going toe to toe, so I kind of enjoyed that. But I suppose Higgins was probably the one I, uh, I feel like I have to really get myself up for. Uh, the hardest is probably someone like, probably Selby or Peter Redman for, the, for their style of play because um, they can be quite you know, slow and make the balls go scrappy and that I don't enjoy. And, and even for you, I guess that that surname Higgins would probably come under your kind of choice of who you liked playing against? You mean Alex Higgins? Yep. Yeah, yeah. There was only one Higgins for me, yeah. I mean, uh, and that was Alex Higgins. And uh, it's just like Ronnie does, you know. Uh, you go to, I mean, I don't know if any of you have been lucky enough to be at the Crucible, or Ali Pally now you go. And the atmosphere, it, it does make the, the hairs on your back of your neck stand up when these people are introduced, you know, and that's great for snooker. And as I say, Ronnie's carried that on, that legacy. And uh, yeah, those are the people that get people on the edge of the seat and want to watch him play. And, and we, all, we all owe a debt to Alex Higgins. I mean, everyone who works in snooker now, to a greater or lesser extent, owes a debt to Alex. And, and I know you've got sort of, do you remember the first time you met Alex or anything he said to you or? Yeah, I, I met Alex when I was about nine. And I was just, and I, I always remember he did, he used to have this thing with cues, so he'd pick, he'd have three cues and chop the top off of one, yeah. chop the middle off of another, and chop the end off of and put it all together himself. Yeah. And I remember yeah. I turned up for an exhibition, my dad said, don't let him touch your cue. <laughs> and I, I, and I've, got, I've got this picture indoors of me standing with Alex Higgins and the ten other players, and Higgins is just looking at my cue. <laughs> <laughs> I always think oh, it's quite know. funny, you know, and... Um, know. But yeah, I've become quite good friends with Alex. I used to go and collect his Guinness. I was only 16. He used to get me to go and get his Guinness so I got his frame. <laughs> so I got his, uh, what do you call it, barman. barman. Yeah. And a lot of people say that Alex, a lot of people say that you changed the way the game was played. Do you think he was the first one who, who changed the way snooker was played? Uh, he was well, different. You know, I think, he, I think with Higgins, he brought rock and roll to snooker and he brought like yeah. a different crowd of people. He was just exciting, you know, and, and Higgins, he could walk into a room and the atmosphere would just change. And I think you're, you're born with that. And he was a genius and he was the best thing I think that ever happened to snooker. Yeah. You know, we all f have to thank Alex. Yeah. I always remember just one story. I've got many stories about Alex Higgins, but the one that always sticks in my head he used to practice at the club in Salford where I played in this Potters club when the qualifiers for the world, or not the qualifiers, they split the world into two and he played in the Withenshaw side. And every morning he'd come into the club and he'd take a bit of weight out of the boat and he'd be messing around and all that. And then one morning I went in and he went, JV, I've got the secret. And I thought, oh, we had a bit of wisdom from the great Alex Higgins. I said, what is it, Alex? He said, whiskey and milk. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what he drank during that tournament, yeah. Uh, here's an interesting one from uh, Katie from the Woodhill Spa. What are you most afraid of? I think this probably means off the table. Oh, um, I don't know. Uh, nothing, really. 
Snakes. Snakes. Snakes, yeah. Anything like that. Snakes. Yeah, yeah snakes. So I ha a lot, lot of talk with you during the UK about you perhaps going into the jungle. How would you cope with snakes in the jungle? Oh, no, no, I couldn't do it. <laughs> End of story. It's, it's, me, it's me out. <laughs> Anything you're scared of, JV? The ex-wife. <laughs> Okay, Paul from Boston says, what would you say is harder? A lot of people have this, this debate. A maximum break, mm. a nine darter, mm. or a hole in one? Interesting. Interesting. No, no contest for you, JV? Well, a hole in one is sheer luck. I've had a hole in one. And I had a hole in the other one as well. <laughs> a nine darts is what it says. Nine shots, isn't it? It's nine shots. A one four seven. How many shots is it? Fifteen reference. Thirty. Thirty-six shots in it. So the one four seven. Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Okay. Uh, Hannah from Birmingham says, "Do you think there will be a time when women will be competing in the big snooker tournaments alongside the men?" Um, I, th I think it's possible. Uh, I think they should have their own tour, a bit like the, the, t the tennis and the golf people do, so as at least then they can improve and become the best in their field and play regular competition. And then if they're good enough, yeah, I definitely don't see why. I mean, we had Alison Fisher, and she was capable of beating anybody. So yeah, yeah, give great them the play. Right, um, and Leanne Evans, who yeah, plays Leanne, now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember someone saying to me, anatomically, is there any reason why a girl can't play as good as a man? And the only thing I could say, I've never heard of the girl. <laughs> uh, Shane says... Oh, I hadn't. <laughs> when do you think you'll hit a thousand centuries? Um, probably next season. Next season. for uh, How many are you on at the moment? Anyone know? Uh, 904 or 5, I think it is. is it? It's yeah, yeah. Next season. Is that I think so. Is that all? I thought it was on about 9.20, Is it 9.20? Oh, well, I'm I sorry. Uh, but that, that's the thing. Hopefully, we'll keep Ronnie going. Because it's hard work travelling around, living out of a suitcase. But there are goals still there, aren't there? The thousand centuries to win more majors than Hendry. So there are goals, and hopefully that will keep him playing for us. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> So, a question here, off the table, are there plans for any more books? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I always said, you know, other than playing snooker and stuff like that, the, the best things I've done was when I written my two autobiographies. Um, I enjoyed the process, I got great feedback from the public, you know, to, that identified with me and they said, you know, it really helped me out. So, I think, you know, to, that, that was good, so, yeah, why not? Brilliant. Well, okay. if you haven't read, read Framed or Double Kiss, and I think there is a third one coming in that series, yeah? Yeah. Do, do you know when that's going to be out? Is that some point next year, maybe? Is Double Kiss out now? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I've read Framed. I, okay. uh, oh, I, I, I read it in one afternoon. Cool. Got sunburnt, sunstroke and everything. <laughs> I just... <laughs> lovely book. I, I didn't know Double Kiss was out. And have you had a book out recently? Yeah, I have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Say good night, JV. <laughs> <laughs> okay, James from Lincoln says, "Are there any plans for you to run a marathon?" Yeah. When okay. I, when I finish playing snooker and I get my injury sorted out, which I need to have an operation done, once I do that, I'll definitely run a marathon and try and try and go under three hours. That'd be my goal. Under three hours. Wow. Wow. And I'm going to try and eat one. <laughs> Okay, a couple more. Uh, Dave from Sleaford says, I play billiards. Has Ronnie played the game? And what are your thoughts on billiards? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a brilliant game. I mean, um, I'm not very good at it, because uh, you're, you're meant to go in off, and it's, it's kind of different to snooker, but I think it's a great, great game. And I've had a 100 break before, but someone had to tell me what shots to play. So it's just experience, you know, but I'm, I'm a snooker player, not a billiard player. So, but I, I respect the game. Grown up playing billiards? Yeah, I play a lot of billiards. Unfortunately, it's not a spectator sport. No. I admire the talent, but when, when you think that the highest of billiard break ever was 499,000. <laughs> yeah, I bet that was an exciting week at Burroughs and Watts Hall. 
It's a record break, yeah. Uh, Kev says, would you be the player you are now had it not been for the influence of Dr. Steve Peters? Um, I was always that player that I am. I haven't improved. I think I just mentally, Steve's helped me to, to, to try and enjoy it a bit more out there, stop putting pressure on myself and... Um, just accept that you can't play perfect all the time, which I still find difficult, but I'm more accepting of that situation. So yeah, I, have to, I think the last six years I owe to Steve Peters because he's helped me sort of manage to deal with my mind when I'm out there playing, it's rather than just give up and get the hump with myself. And now just, I try right to the end and see, see if I get lucky. So you were the first person in the sport to really kind of embrace a mind coach. Any mind coaches in your day, JV? Yeah, my ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> Matt from Portsmouth says, Ronnie, is Earl Strickland a scary character and did you beat him at pool? He's very scary. <laughs> he's very, but he's a lovely, lovely guy and I really love Earl, but he is a very intimidating character. A little bit in the same way that Alex Higgins was, you kind of yeah, knew yeah. what they were going to do next. I met him a couple of times, yeah. he's a character, yeah. But I think that's what makes him such a great character. Yeah, well, yeah, so, yeah. Um, you yeah, need characters in sport. And he's a winner as well. So. And he's a winner, yeah, and a good pool player. Absolutely. Uh, Jenny says, if there's one thing you could change about your career, mm. what would it be and why? Um, I don't think I'd change anything about my career. Um, I'd probably like to have broke Stephen Hendry's record and got eight world titles, but I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm just so happy that I've achieved what I've achieved and, I, you know, it'd be crazy to, you know, obviously win, win more world titles, I suppose, would have been something more, you know, instead of M5, probably over about eight by now would have been nice. Yeah. But still five's okay. And <laughs> JV, obviously you've had a hugely successful career away from playing. Mm. Does anything compare with, with playing in no, your day? No, 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 no. That is a thrill and that's why you used to practice all hours that God sends, you know, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it'd have been nice to have a world championship on my CV. It never happened. I lost to Dennis Taylor in one semi-final, so that, not, that put me head in a jar for about 10 years. <laughs> and uh, I thought about buying his glasses off him, but uh, no, they wouldn't have worked for me. <laughs> no, but listen, there's nothing like playing, and if you've got the ability, uh, it's great. But as I say, it's not easy. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of travelling, living out of suitcases, and... Uh, you know, 17 days at the Crucible is a long time, isn't it? Mm. And that's why I always say that Jimmy struggled to win the world title. Because mm. 17 days in the life of Jimmy White is a long time, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> it is. It is. And here's an interesting one. So when you finally do call time on the playing career, and we all hope that's a long way in the future, what will Ronnie O'Sullivan do? Um... I, don't, I just want to be involved in snooker, maybe like, like you know, like I do with Eurosport at the moment. I, like, I love watching snooker, I love being at the venues, I love, you know, being around the players and, you know, they've been like a family to mine for like 30 years. Obviously, I love, this is, I love playing snooker and I love to entertain and I love nights like tonight, you know, where you can just play and, you know, express yourself and... So, as, as long as I can still perform and you know i think just do magic on the table then i'd still be doing exhibitions and, yeah sure you know you i just lo I, I love the lifestyle of a snooker player i don't enjoy like john says you know week after week going from country to country so i, I slow that down a bit but then you know i still love to play so to come and do nights like this you know hopefully till i'm 60 65 if i keep myself fit um why not you know um, snooker's been good to me so there you go he's 42 now and he said he'll come back when he's 65 so <laughs> Best, uh, Nigel, get, get the exhibition book now. Um, it's been a fantastic couple of days here in Lincoln. I hope tonight's been a bit different, and we know how great he is on the table, um, but hopefully this has given you a little insight to the man himself. Um, thank you, Nigel and Ali, for putting on an absolutely fantastic night. I know on behalf of JV and Ronnie and Michaela, we've had such a great time. You've looked after us so well, and uh, you can cheer Ronnie on in Preston next week. In... Uh, in the, in the Grand Prix and until the next time can I say a massive massive thank you to all of us and your two people Mr. John Virgo and Mr. Ronnie O'Sullivan thank you very much.